Amen. Thank you. Isn't it wonderful having a choir back? Amen. And wonderful to see the chancel choir mixed with uh, St. Mark's singers. Thank you, Michael, Kat, and for Dick for accompanying this morning. We're going to uh, join in prayer. Let's pray together. Oh God, as we come and explore about you, we pray that you'll open our minds and our hearts and our lives so that we may make you real. Bless us as we reflect on your word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for the next 10 weeks, we're going to be exploring God, and it really is intriguing. I have been living with this for several months now, and I'm finding what I'm having to do is to cut things out rather than look for things to include over 10 weeks. Uh, God is in trouble and needs our help. Amen. Uh, sadly, our consumer-driven culture seems to think that we make God in our own image rather than the other way around. Amen? Um, I love the Anne Lamarck quote that says, You can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. <laughs> it's so true. Okay, so between now and Thanksgiving, we'll be exploring together both our experiences of God, how we experience God, and what we think we know or believe about God. And I hope we can pull all of this out of our own personal closets and give God an airing so that we can renew our sense of God at work in our lives. And so when somebody uh, asks you, well, tell me about the God that you believe in, I'm hoping by the end of this series you'll be ready with your elevator speech, if you're not already. That's the three-minute explanation of what God means to you. The problem with talking about God is that we have to use words, of course, and I love the quote from the great mystic of the church, Meister Eckhart, who says, Be silent and do not chatter about God, for when you chatter about God, you are telling lies and sinning. Whoa, look out. Judaism really struggled with what to do about all of this, and they made the decision a long, long time ago simply not to name God. So that when you read the text often of the Hebrew Scripture, you'll find that God's word isn't there. And even in informal conversation, uh, they will use the, the expression Hashem, which means simply the name, because they can't name God, right? It keeps God mysterious and keeps God in some ways unknown as well as very known. Um, one of the most famous names in church history, St. Augustine, said that if you have understood, then what you have understood is not God. All right? So are, are you challenged already to do some reviewing, some rethinking? And remember that God, G-O-D, is a word. And it happens to be an English word. And some people, of course, we know about this, get very confused when uh, people use the name Allah for God. Well, that just happens to be the Arabic word for God. Arabic Christians refer to God as Allah, right? It's not just Muslims, and it's, it's not anybody else's God. And It's really interested me over the years. Um, I say the Arabic word for God is Allah. In Welsh, it's Agluid. Try getting your mouth around that one. In French, Dieu. In Greek, Theos. In Mende of Sierra Leone, in Gewo. Words that don't sound similar at all. Uh, some words in different languages sound much the same, but the word for God doesn't. It changes a lot. And there's nothing magic in that word. And I suspect that if we could put a camera inside each of your brains at the moment and project up on the screen your image of God, what God looks like, we'd have as many different pictures on the screen as there are people in the room. Is that, am I right? Um, 
I, I think for a lot of us, uh, we grew up with a male image of God, often an old man with a beard sitting on a throne. Is that right? Uh, anybody got that one? Um, for some people, their image of God actually equates with somebody they knew. Uh, sometimes uh, a mentor in faith when they were a teenager or, or at some stage in their life. Uh, God's location is generally understood to be either out there or up there. And uh, uh, that, that's sort of confusing. Um, it was easier when the earth was flat, by the way, to have God up there. Um, <laughs> And, you know, the old scheme was down there was the, you know, the hot place. And up there was the heavenly place, and we could all be cheery about it. But it was up above the roof that covered, sort of like that TV series, The Dome. You know, there was a big dome. Um, well, we've moved beyond that, except in the TV series. So, um, I think for some people... God is like a great big parent, and I always think of Monty Python and that great big finger coming out of the sky. Uh, Marcus Borg calls this God the finger shaker. The one who's pointing out how you're doing it wrong again. Anybody know that one? Oh yes, I can tell. I think for most of us, God uh, as creator is pretty important. We've got the idea, uh, somehow, we don't know quite the mechanics, how it all works, but God made the whole of the universe, and especially the beautiful parts, and uh, we worry about the other parts, uh, and we worry about what we're doing to the planet. Uh, but the whole thing gets very confused when you start to read the creation story, especially when you get to chapter 3 of Genesis, where you hear about God walking in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day. I wonder what God looked like walking in the garden at the cool of the day. Do you have a picture? I wonder what that picture is for you. And then there are big words. Uh, we like to use big words when we talk about God because it makes us feel intelligent and it makes God feel bigger. Uh, so we use words like transcendent, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, and it somehow comforts us to think that God is a God of big words. And then there's the notion that everything that happens in the world is the will of God. Oh my goodness, what a dangerous uh, concept of God. So many people after 9-11 in the United States suddenly discovered that they couldn't believe in God anymore because how could God let that happen? You've heard that, haven't you? Well, I mean, people wake up. 20,000 children die every day around the globe. Did you not notice? Did nobody notice that this has been happening for a long, long time. And God lets that happen. How can we suddenly notice when it's our people? And that raises the question about whether God has a nationality. Is God an American? Oh God, I'm glad you're laughing. <laughs> I've said before that I, I really cringed during the Gulf War and we saw those billboards saying, in God we trust. There was one right outside my office window in San Francisco and it just really got to me. Thinking about all the people involved in the Gulf War all believed that God was on their side, as happens in virtually every war. So is God a nationalist? Is God militaristic? I, I'm, I don't think so. So, I've questioned a lot of some of, the, well, at least some of the popular images and ideas of God. Let's turn and, and look about what we can affirm with confidence. What we can say we do know uh, is true about God. Um, Marcus Borg wants us to hold on to one of those big words, uh, which may be unfamiliar to some. And this is the word panentheism. Panentheism. Not pantheism, that's something different. It's got E-N in the middle. Panentheism. And this concept says that God is not only the creator of everything that is, but that God is in everything that is, and even transcends everything that is. God is all around us and within us. God is not somewhere else, like heaven. Uh, God is here. 
Uh, and this is very close to what Ed Cole was telling us a few weeks back. Um, it's, and it's nothing new. This is not a radically new concept. Indeed, it predates Christianity in many cultures around the world. So many first people cultures like the Native American culture and African traditional religions, traditional religions uh, in South America, well, all over the world have been confident about God being present in everything for a long, long time. And we're having to relearn that because of our Western dualistic conditioning. A second affirmation we can clearly make God is, uh, make about God is this. Most of us, if not all of us, have experienced God, both in what we might call unusual, mysterious encounters, uh, or in fairly normal, routine, everyday encounters. We just sense an energy or a force we choose to call God. Some of us also experience God in our dreams, or in a sense of being led. Something happens in our daily routine, and we suddenly find ourselves doing something, and we sense that God is leading us to do it. Some of us have the experiences we come forward to the table and receive the bread and the cup. Something different happens inside our souls and we say, well, this is God at work. It's a strengthening force, a renewing force that we know inside ourselves. The third way I think we sense that we know about God, I've always liked uh, Martin Luther King's sermon called Our God is Able. And it closes with these words. And so we know that God is able to give us the interior resources to face the darkness as well as the light. Let this affirmation be our ringing cry. It will give us courage to face the uncertainties of the future. It will give our tired feet new strength as we continue our forward stride toward the city of freedom. When our days become dreary with low hovering clouds and our nights become even darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember that there is a great benign power in the universe whose name is God, and God is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. This is our hope for becoming better people. This is our mandate for seeking to make a better world. So I would paraphrase Dr. King's words by saying that for me, God is like an electric power. It's like an energy that I can plug into. When God is at work, I can tell because there's heat, there's light happening as a result of God's presence. Things change when God is working in me. Healing comes, justice comes, peace comes. People's lives are given new dignity and purpose. In the old language, we used to talk about saving souls or converting people or helping people to find Jesus. I prefer the language of enabling people to plug into the God power that can really make a difference in their lives and the lives of others. If God isn't making a difference, then it probably isn't God. If a new way out of no way isn't being created, to use Dr. King's language, then we need to bring God into the situation. And it's not only new avenues for our own belief and our own experience, our own spiritual well-being that are at stake here. Ours is a God of history, a God of justice, a God who challenges us to build the beloved community, not just here at St. Mark's, but around the world. Let's take a quick look at some areas where God might be at work. For example, there is Ferguson, Missouri. You can tell I haven't been preaching for several months, can't you? Ferguson, Missouri, a name that has become synonymous with injustice and insensitivity. There is little doubt in my mind that something was very wrong in the shooting death of Michael Brown. Now, I, you can say, I don't know the details of the situation. Nobody does really yet. But we're probably writing and assuming that something is very wrong because it's the same kind of situation that's happened hundreds of times before. Young black men are getting shot and it makes no sense. It's literally unbelievable that such a community as Ferguson, Missouri could have only three African-American police officers 
and truly staggering that the city leadership, including the police leadership, the mayor, the city council, lots of other elected officials can speak about the situation with such rank insensitivity. It was not only the original shooting that, that was horrendous, but the response. There is God work to be done here, as well as in thousands of other Fergusons, not to mention in Sacramento. Our God can indeed make a way in Ferguson, Missouri. Make a way out of no way in Sacramento, California. Then there's Gaza. I visited Gaza years ago and was so impressed by people. But it's a terrible place. It's a huge prison camp. A refugee camp, a series of refugee camps. And when I went, it was before the latest round of violence. And surely there are no simple solutions. Everybody is responsible for violence, and there's plenty of blame to go around. So let's not get involved in the tit for tat, he said, she said kind of arguments. Let's stop arguing and build justice and build peace. Let's get beyond blame and stop the culture of revenge in its tracks. Our God can make a way out of no way and turn dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. Then there's the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Since when was Doctors Without Borders the world's only response to a lethal epidemic that has killed thousands and is threatening to kill tens of thousands more? If this were happening in Germany or in Kentucky, there would have been a massive response to contain it and to find solutions. African lives are still deeply undervalued currency. The governments of Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia are apparently paralyzed, and the rest of the world passes by on the other side. But our God can make a way out of no way. So those are just three situations. There are many, many more where God is at work and can be at work through us. So, let me ask you, how is God making a way out of no way in your life and our life together? Where is God at work 